appreciate the Department of Health being here today. Um, look forward to their presentation and look forward to uh, some great questions from, uh, from our, the members of our committee. I want to, I would think most people, uh, at least on the committee and most people in this room probably understand, but I want to say it out loud before we get started. Um, there's a difference between the Department of Health and the Board of Health. Uh, there's been a lot said about the Board of Health and their actions. Uh, the people here today do not control uh, the Board of Health. They are not the ones who wrote uh, many of the rules that have caused a lot of problems. And uh, I just, I have a lot of respect for what the department has done on a very short time frame, uh, getting these rules ready. Uh, it's been yeoman's work and, and they still have a long way to go. And so I uh, just wanted to, to clarify uh, that this is the Department of Health that will be here today. Uh, it is not the Board of Health that is here today. So uh, questions on what, what the board did and why uh, the people here today probably cannot answer those. So uh, with that, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time uh, listening to myself, I do encourage uh, everyone, remember that we are streaming live. Uh, for those of you who uh, do not want to be heard, uh, please move your microphones away from you. Uh, those of you who are uh, speaking, whether you're presenting. <laughs> I've, I've just been reminded uh, from the back door that to, uh, today is... Rush Springs Watermelon Festival Day at the Capitol. So when we take a break down on four, there will be watermelon uh, for anybody who wants some. So uh, it's not every day that someone walks in the back of the room and starts waving watermelon at you. Uh, it's just another day at the Capitol. Uh, so please, uh, presenters, uh, those of you from the Board of Health, please remember to speak into the microphone. Uh, Members of the committee, when you're asking questions, again, remind you to speak into the microphone. Uh, that is uh, for dual purpose, number one, so the people who are watching the live stream can hear everything that's said, but also um, because Senator Paxton is officially an old man today, uh, and so he's going to need all the help he can get. We may need to turn the speakers up. Um, we... I'm not supposed to say his age, but if you think a half of a century is old, then he is old. Um, I'll let you be the judge of that, but he was thrilled to get the AARP invite card in the mail recently. So uh, happy birthday to Senator Paxton, and please speak up. Someone his age will need all the help he can get hearing today. So, uh, And I'm happy that your wife was able to drive you in. That was, was very sweet of her. Uh, with, with that, I, I will uh, turn it over. Uh, and just kind of to, to let you know the format here, uh, Department of Health has brought a uh, presentation. Uh, we will go through that, let them make that presentation. Uh, we will then take a short break after that presentation. Uh, members of the committee, you should have gotten some handouts with that. Um, in that handout is uh, a couple of lists of possible recommendations. I want to take a break and let, make sure you've had time to read through that information uh, before we start that question and answer period. So we'll take that break after the presentation uh, so you can read through those things and be prepared to ask your questions. So with that, I will uh, introduce Commissioner Tom Bates and uh, ask you to come to the podium and uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you again for being here, and uh, thank you again for, to you and your staff for the hard work you've put in uh, getting us to where we are today. Well, thank you, Senator um, Thank you, all, first of all, for the invitation uh, to come today. Uh, thank you and uh, Leader Eccles for that. And um, so we can give the perspective of the Department of Health on these issues surrounding medical marijuana. I'd also like to thank each member of the working group um, for, uh, for your leadership in this area and your willingness to serve um, and, and, and grapple with these uh, kind of difficult issues. Um, when I arrived at OSDH in April, um, there's no secret it wasn't under the best of circumstances. And uh, my message to the staff there um, on day one was that despite the recent challenges, 
uh, that this team at the, at the department would be ready uh, to implement the provisions of state question 788 should, the will, should that be the will of the people. And um, I told them that I was betting on them, okay? I was betting on the team of the, the program leaders at, at the department. And uh, they have, they have uh, answered that bell in a resounding way. And it's just a real honor and privilege uh, to work with them on a daily basis. So before I get into the meat of uh, my comments or the presentation, I'd like to just take a minute to introduce some of the, some of the people um, that have been leading the charge around medical marijuana at the department, uh, getting, re you know, the, the getting ready and uh, really burning some, burning some midnight oil. And, and uh, they're taking these duties on in addition to their, to their regular duties. So with that, I have uh, sitting here, uh, Brian Downs, our, our chief of staff, um, Melissa Miller, who is the, uh, the newly minted communications manager for the Oklahoma Medical Marijuana Authority, Alicia Harris, um, here's Alicia. Um, she's our uh, patient licensing manager for OMMA. Adrian Rollins is the director of health policy planning and partnerships at OSDH. And again, Adrian is one of those that's really had to take on. Of course, we have um, Buffy Heater, and she's the chief of our, of our policy shop, policy director at, uh, at OSDH. I call her our policy guru. And um, again, somebody that, in addition to our other duties, has been taken on leading this effort. We have uh, also some people over here. We have Dr. Derek Pate. Um, again, the director, he's the director of the Center for Health Statistics at OSDH. But just an example of somebody that we had to pull in, somebody with tremendous amount of expertise and knowledge that we had to pull in to, to help us with that. And Derek's done a phenomenal job. Spencer Cousin. Where's Spencer? There's Spencer, um, our policy development coordinator at OSDH. And um, last but not least, we have uh, Nicole Nash, one of our staff attorneys, who joined, when did you start at OSDH? Two months, Two months ago. And so, needless to say, um, she's had a baptism by fire <laughs> as, as one of our staff attorneys. Again, before I get into the, uh, to the meat of the, the comments, um, I would like to go over the packet that we've prepared for you, is, as Senator McCourtney said, there's a cover letter um, from me to the, to the work group. Then there are two, two lists. One is a list of potential statutory changes or policy uh, suggestions from the Department of Health. And then the, th the third uh, item or the second list is a list of policy concerns suggested policy changes that were compiled um, as a result of the conversation we had with our interagency work group. Those are, those are not coming from the Department of Health, but from other agencies that we met with that had concerns or had pieces of, of uh, this picture. So just keep that in mind. And also, uh, there's, there's the PowerPoint that's in your packet that we'll, we'll start going over. that all of these items are posted um, to the OMMA website. So just, you can Google OMMA and go to the website and these items are there. So just a, a brief overview of what we're gonna talk about this morning. We're gonna go over briefly the requirements of State Question 788. I know y'all are probably uh, very familiar with that, but we'll, we'll talk about those briefly. Talk about the current efforts that the department is undergoing. Um, the creation of the Medical Marijuana Authority um, the emergency rules that were approved and, and revised, uh, important dates and future rulemaking timelines, and the impact of potential legal and legislative action. So, State question 788. Again, no secret, specifies very rapid deadlines for OSDH to make applications available uh, within 30 days after passage and to start accepting applications and to provide a response to applicants within 14 days. I am uh, pleased to state that 
the, all of the applications, whether it be for uh, the patient license or the various uh, commercial licenses, uh, were made available uh, July 26th and, and are available on the website now. They've, uh, they've been updated due to the recent rule changes and, and, and are available. And uh, we, were, we are well on our way to meeting the 60-day uh, deadline as well. Um, as you know, uh, about the, you know, from an operational standpoint, um, you know, Senator uh, McCourty, you've asked me about concerns. Uh, one of my biggest concerns from an operational standpoint for the department is, is the 14-day uh, turnaround on the applications. Not so much that were properly vetted uh, those commercial applications to make sure that everybody's properly registered with the Secretary of State to the extent that um, legislative changes are, are made to allow for background checks and so forth, just to make sure that we uh, know we have uh, reputable people engaging in this business and, and that's really more of as much a consumer protection uh, condition as anything else. So as we know, State question 788 does not require any qualifying conditions for medical marijuana. Um, it specifies eight different license categories. Um, the medical marijuana patient, the caregiver, dispensary, commercial grower, processing, transportation, research, and a temporary license for people coming in out of state. And so we've had to go through and, and develop unique um, uh, work processes for licenses and licensing categories. Word out already, huh? Okay. It also requires the development of a 12 member board um, to establish food safety standards um, and medical marijuana processing and handling. Um, I expect we'll be announcing that. Uh, we had hoped to announce it yesterday. I'm confident we can get, get that announcement out today of the makeup of that 12 member board. Uh, frankly, that's been a little more challenging because you're trying to find people that have expertise not only in food safety food handling, but some, some uh, expertise surrounding um, the interaction between food standards and, and medical marijuana. So identifying those 12 persons, uh, we've tried to be very, uh, be very thoughtful and diligent in doing that. Um, state question 788 allows also for the inspections of processing sites and requires auditing of monthly reports from dispensaries, growers, processors, and researchers. So um, the uh, let me see, going through, the, going through my notes here. I don't want to forget anything that Buffy's told me to say. Um, so, on current OSDH efforts, as I mentioned in the, uh, at the beginning, the, uh, in April, uh, we asked the Board of Health to authorize the creation of a work group um, and steering committee at the department. Again, and that's what we've been working on ever since in order to meet these, these rapid deadlines. So we, we, we mobilized work groups in April, uh, again, to, lever to leverage all the existing expertise throughout the agency. Um, and with the passage of the state question, members of these work groups have been responsible for tasks necessary to implement the program until permanent program staff are in place. And so the areas uh, that these work groups have been focusing on and broken up into are licensing, reporting and data security, creation of regulations, promulgation of agency rules, uh, monitoring health impacts and injury prevention, obviously communications, and building operations and staffing. So from a very simple standpoint, how do we get this staff into our existing structure, get, make sure everybody has a home and a workstation? So the Medical Marijuana Steering Committee includes members from each of these work groups, and they meet at a, uh, uh, at a minimum on a weekly basis to present progress to me and other uh, leadership members at OSDH and to subject matter experts as well. So more about uh, our current efforts. So, you know, we've spent a lot of time in the initial stages were in developing the application requirements and forms that again, that were posted um, within the 30-day timeline. Um, a technology platform, 
um, has been developed. Uh, we've contracted with a, uh, a vendor by the uh, Complia who has experience in other states doing medical marijuana programs to basically set up a, a licensing platform in hopes of making this system as automated as possible from a cost saving standpoint. And at this point, I'd like, it would be, I would be uh, negligent if I did not uh, give a big thanks to our partners at OMES, uh, Denise Northrup, um, Bo Reese, Sarju Shaw, Tanner Hughes, who was our in-house uh, OMES uh, designee at uh, OSDH. That entire team has been at our beck and call and at our disposal as we work through this. And it's something that we could, um, it's been a real example of agency partnership uh, that you have to have on a, on, a big, uh, on a big project like this. So again, been working on building operations and staffing uh, to make sure that uh, the necessary staff uh, and space are available for the program. Trying to be proactive in our communications, making sure we had the website up and running uh, basically the night uh, of the election um, and uh, continually keeping that updated and researching potential health impacts, gathering data from other states, communicating with other states about their experiences. This might be a good time. I know a lot of you may have questions about how we're paying for this and, and what the costs have been so far. Um, the IT platform that I just discussed with Complia, um, that contract was um, about, I think it was about $480,000. And we also estimate that there will be some OMES costs uh, to support that effort on an ongoing basis that will be roughly um, in the same ballpark. So roughly $1 million we're estimating for the IT platform. Um, personnel, uh, we're talking about around, we're estimating about $2.6 million for that. $800,000 of that is a, is a contract with GALT. Uh, for um, temporary staff. We're estimating about uh, $100,000 for the cost of printing the, the licenses or the ID cards themselves that, that people will receive. Um, an additional $400,000 for uh, vendor supplies, marketing, education, things like that. Um, and supplies and set up about $100,000. Again, you know, we've had to go out, we have, you know, for the staff that we're uh, that we're hiring, we're having to obtain computers, we're setting up a call center for, uh, for questions that people will have. So getting the headsets, the phone systems, all those things. So that's, um, those, that's what's been spent so far, um, or will be spent in the near future, I should say. And um, we've committed uh, to giving um, both uh, the speaker and the pro tem monthly updates on, on the expenditures surrounding uh, medical marijuana. Uh, our first update is due, I think, September 1st. Is that right, Brian? And we'll be uh, making those available. In fact, we'll probably, we will be posting those updates on the OMMA website. Um, so again, you know, after, after the passage of the state question, we, we established uh, the Medical Marijuana Authority, or OMMA, and this is the program unit within the department that will be responsible for managing and medical marijuana program, including application processing, licensing, and compliance monitoring. Again, um, the OMMA program resides within the State Department of Health and falls under the authority of the agency and the commissioner. The program director will be responsible for and oversee all aspects of program implementation. Um, selection of the director is currently on hold, pending implementation and stabilization of the program after August 25th. As everyone is widely known, we, we posted for that position. We did interview candidates, but I made the decision um, that based on, uh, after going through those interviews, that I just didn't think it was the right time to introduce another personality into the team with the compressed deadlines and things that we, that we have going on. Um, frankly, this, this group and this team was, was working too well together that I didn't want to do anything that could, could jeopardize that performance you know, um, on such a tight deadline. So, um, and frankly, 
I think um, we also want to see uh, what the future is of the Medical Marijuana Authority based on decisions uh, or recommendations that this work group may, may develop. Um, if, it, if, it continues, if we continue to house this in the Department of Health, so be it, we'll, we'll, we'll make those staffing decisions. But if legislators decide to go another direction, you know, in fairness to those persons, it might be, might be better to wait. So some website analytics. So um, again, our, these are some uh, website analytics from July 26 and the day shortly after, thereafter when our applications uh, went up on the website. Um, you, so the, these numbers, the numbers below were experienced in one day. Uh, again, and this, this is the first milestone identified in state question 788. Unique visitors, 11,101, 23,000 page views. Uh, and then we had s some similar traffic on uh, social media. Um, the OMMA Twitter account received 144 additional followers. 5,049 tweet impressions, um, 637 page views of the OMMA Facebook account, 341 likes, uh, 400, uh, almost 4,800 people reached on July 26, and um, 381 page followers on July 27th. So I mean, again, just some, some uh, examples of the interest that this is creating. So again, not to I don't want to necessarily you know, rehash the, some of the experience with the rules, but I think I do want everyone to be aware of the timelines and how those, uh, and what we're, what we're working under. So the Board of Health approved uh, the initial emergency rules for the implementation of 780, of 788 on July 10th. Um, the governor approved these emergency rules on July 11th. Uh, the emergency rulemaking process included the review of over 1,000 public comments, and we will talk a little more as we get deeper into the um, presentation about some of the trends of those comments. Um, and also, we had consultation with various stakeholders and, again, state agencies through the work group that, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Oklahoma, uh, Attorney General Hunter uh, issued a letter uh, in response to a letter that I had sent him uh, on July 18th. Uh, indicating that the Board of Health had promulgated several rules in excess of its statutory authority uh, as set out in State Question 788. The revised emergency rules were posted on July 27th. Um, and after reviewing that next draft, we received some additional advice and counsel from the AG's office. Uh, and a special meeting of the Board of Health occurred on August 1st. To, uh, on August 1st in which uh, the latest rule draft uh, was considered and approved and, um, is, and has now been uh, approved by the governor. It's no secret, and I've, we've said uh, from the beginning, that State Question 788, as written, has some significant gaps. And while I stand here ready to implement the State Question as written, I think it is, we do need to discuss those gaps. And from a, uh, a public health standpoint, and again, these are the issues that, that the Department of Health is concerned most about. There are other issues surrounding State Question 788 that other state agencies have concerns about, and I know would you know, welcome the opportunity to, to visit with you about those as well. But from the Department of Health's uh, standpoint, there are three uh, big issues that, that we have that are concerns. One is uh, laboratory testing. Subchapter 8 of the uh, version of the rules that was initially approved included language that could be used as a starting point for future discussions around, around what lab testing uh, might look like. Um, the department recommends the establishment of an advisory group to look into and develop what laboratory testing guidelines uh, for the medical marijuana an industry should look like. Um, and the Food Safety Standards Boards in the immediate future could begin work to, to recommend testing uh, guidelines 
as it pertains to food products. But when it gets outside of food, then you know, the broader issue of, of the plant, how it's ingested, uh, those laboratory, that laboratory testing needs to be looked at. I think it's important to remember that these are things, these, whether it be in a smokable form or an edible form, people will be ingesting this into their body. And so we want to make sure, we want to do all that we can to make sure that product is safe for human consumption and uh, that it's not adulterated or contaminated in any way. And so the only way to, to do that is to have some type of uh, testing structure. We would also uh, recommend um, some recall requirements for commercial entities. In the event um, medical marijuana products are found to be unsafe or below standards or contaminated in some way, it's, uh, it's important that the department have the ability to mandate a recall to make sure that those products are pulled off the shelves and public health and safety can be protected. And finally, packaging and labeling. Um, we had some, uh, again, provisions in the first uh, draft that might be a good starting point. Um, and I, there's others, other drafts out there that I know around packaging and labeling, but that is an important issue. Uh, again, from a, a consumer health and safety standpoint, people need to know what's, uh, uh, what they're buying and, and, and what, they're, what they're putting into their bodies. And so there needs to be some provisions around clear and concise packaging and labeling. Some addition, an additional public health concern uh, would include amending uh, Title 63 and 21 uh, to include marijuana uh, in the smoking in public places and clean indoor air statutes and to close loopholes um, in those statutes that might um, that concern people. Um, Another area uh, that we need to look at is amending Oklahoma Administrative Code, Title 310, Chapter 515, to include um, explicitly the reporting of cannabis-related poisonings and other injury, and un other injuries um, under the Healthcare Information Act. Now, again, another area of robust public comment that is outside the purview of the Department of Health. Um, but again, that's, those were the, this, you, did, you did ask for uh, areas of comment that we received. Dealt with provi provisions for employers and zoning. Uh, state question specifies that an employer may not, discriminate, may not discriminate against a person in hiring, termination, or imposing any term or condition of employment or otherwise penalize a person based solely upon the person's status as a license holder or the results of a drug, a drug test showing positive for marijuana. Employers may take action against a license holder if the, use, if the holder uses or possesses marijuana while in the holder's place of employment or during hours of employment. Employers may not take action against a license holder based solely on the status as a license holder and no city or local municipality may unduly change or restrict zoning laws to prevent the opening of retail marijuana establishments. Per the emergency rules, dispensaries must provide proof its location is not within 1,000 feet of any public or private school entrance. Obviously, OSDH is not a workplace policy or expert on these issues. We're just bringing this issue to your attention. Again, it was an area of robust public comment. It may be something uh, that you know, where an advisory committee could be established to develop recommendations um, around these issues uh, specifically. And again, provisions for employers and the ability for local communities to define their zoning and ordinances were again a large source of public comment. So additional statutory language clarifying businesses and employers policies regarding medical marijuana, you know, should, should be considered. So going on to uh, slide 11, the revised emergency rules reflect the provisions set forth in state question 788 to provide for implementation of a regulatory program. 
including but not limited to clarification and changes to certain definitions, certain requirements for commercial applicants, certain requirements of a recommending physician, certain patient license holder requirements, certain medical marijuana product requirements, requirements for dispensing medical marijuana, requirements for the inventory tracking, records, reports, and audits of commercial entities, and composition of the medical marijuana industry expert food safety standards board. So these are all areas that were revised from the first draft to the, to the draft that was signed, um, that was passed on August 1st and signed by the governor on the 6th. The revised emergency rules basically reflect uh, a bare bones approach of the provisions of the state question uh, and provide for implementation of a regulatory program uh, including but not limited to and there was a clarification of certain definitions and uh, the ones in bold Senator McCourtney were areas of again really robust public comment uh, the dispensary manager and the requirements for a licensed pharmacist uh, were removed uh, the term licensee uh, was modified to exclude inmates of any local county state or federal correctional facility or jail uh, the prior definition just excluded inmates of DOC definitions for private and public schools um, were added and um, after a lot of discussion we just went with the Black's Law dictionary definitions of a public and private school um, but again that was an area of um, uh, we received a lot of public comment in that area. Uh, owners and ownership interest and the requirements for minimum percent interest uh, were removed. Um, and language around an approved laboratory uh, was removed altogether. Moving on to slide 13. Uh, there was a clarification in the in the new rules of certain requirements for commercial applicants uh, and again the ones in bold are were areas where we received the most uh, public comment removes uh, background checks for principal officers adds background check for research applicants and all principal investigators involved in a research project Tried to make clear that the commercial applicants are required under existing law to register with OBNDD and to pay associated fees. No longer requires applicants to provide hours of operation. Uh, submission of this information to OSDH is optional. Uh, requires commercial applicants to provide a certificate of good standing from the Oklahoma Secretary of State uh, to prove that they are registered to do business in Oklahoma as required by the state question. Adjust the age restriction on employees from 21 to 18. Removes altogether the requirements to post a surety bond or validate the authenticity of a patient or caregiver's license. Removes requirement that commercial establishments be enclosed and other additional requirements related to indoor grow. Uh, provides instead that the construction of commercial establishments must meet the standards of any applicable state and local electrical fire plumbing and waste etc and again in, in those areas where other state law apply whether it be the registration of OBN DD whether it be surrounding uh, food handling and food laws relating to edibles we just tried to draw uh, the industry's attention to those areas uh, understanding that there may be some areas where, where those uh, those laws and administrative rules might be in conflict with state question 788 but to make clear that the provisions of state question 788 in case if there was a conflict would control going on to slide 14 further clarification of requirements for commercial applicants requirements relating to um, the dispensing of medical marijuana and product storage standards at a dispensary were removed removes all requirements for transportation of marijuana except that mar medical marijuana must be uh, transported in a clearly labeled and locked container shielded from public view. Uh, rem uh, Subchapter 4 uh, pertaining to requirements for medical research licenses uh, was removed altogether and Subchapter 8 as I mentioned earlier pertaining to requirements for laboratory testing were removed. Uh, 
processors are now um, only limited uh, to commercial establishments uh, subject to annual inspections. I mean, I should say they are the only commercial establishment subject to annual inspections, uh, processors are. Uh, and that again is, you know, from the, from the bare language of the state question. Uh, requires commercial entities to address all waste uh, generated by medical marijuana in a manner consistent with existing rule and statute. Um, removes other, re other uh, requirements regarding the removal of, of waste were removed. Uh, recall procedures, um, again, that was one of the areas that we, that we highlighted for potential uh, legislative uh, action uh, were removed. Um, prohibitions regarding uh, the repackaging of uh, product by dispensaries uh, was, uh, was removed and uh, dispensaries now, may now be collated with other commercial establishments. Um, signage, provisions around signage of products and advertising in certain markets were removed. We did uh, retain a general prohibition on false advertising and advertising to induce persons under 21 to purchase or consume products. So we also made changes to rules uh, regarding requirements of a recommending physician. Uh, physician registration with OSDH is now optional. Um, we do encourage physicians to do that. It will, that allows us to uh, make sure that those physicians MDs and DOs are uh, properly certified and licensed um, and, and once we do that ahead of time that will allow for the quicker processing of uh, patient applications that they that those physicians sign off on. Uh, this requires that a physician use accepted the, the rules as now stated requires that a physician use accepted standards a reasonable prudent physician would follow when recommended any medication to a patient. It removes language requiring physician registration with OBNDD and for the physician to have completed all required training per their licensure board. Removes requirements for a bona fide physician patient relationship and for a physician to have ongoing responsibility for the care of the individual. We had a provision in there that required for a follow up visit and that was, that was removed. Removes statutory, uh, removes requirement for annual assessment of medical need. Uh, for marijuana and related provisions, statutory language grants a two-year license, and that's, that's where we are. Removes requirements for any physician determination relating to risk of substance abuse. Uh, removes restrictions on a physician ownership interest in a commercial establishment and ability for a physician to personally hold a medical marijuana license if actively recommending, making recommendations for other patients. Removes language um, uh, that a physician ascertain whether a patient is pregnant. Again, that was a, uh, an area of robust public comment and that was removed. Uh, again, uh, the requirement uh, that the for, on a, uh, a, a child license, the requirement that the physicians be pediatricians or uh, pediatric specialists uh, was removed. Going on to slide 16, changes uh, to certain patient license holder requirements. Uh, the, re the provision uh, requiring an attestation that the patient will not divert marijuana to an, uh, to an individual or entity that is not lawfully entitled to possess marijuana was removed. Uh, we removed language uh, for patient and caregiver disposal of medical marijuana and grounds for sanctions, uh, as, a, as a grounds for sanctions. Uh, we removed the requirement that home, uh, for homegrown medical marijuana such as obtaining a property owner's written permission uh, in, in the case of a, a landlord-tenant relationship, security and visibility of home grows and closed loop system processing performance uh, and processing performed by patient license holder uh, were, again were removed. And that processing issue, um, I think, you know, again, that's something that the legislature may want to look at. The processing of marijuana can, uh, depending on the method that the person uses, involve uh, some flammable substances. And um, again, if you have that situation uh, with, with there's a landlord-tenant relationship, 
um, or again, just, just the safety of, just public safety as a, as a whole, uh, issues surrounding processing and what's, what's, what the allowable methods of processing are in the homegrown area uh, probably need some attention. Uh, changes to certain uh, medical marijuana product requirements. Um, obviously, the restrictions on smokable marijuana uh, were removed. We removed the subsections which limit the forms of medical marijuana and prohibit the dispensing of marijuana in flower and dry leaf and plant form. Uh, the limitations on THC content were removed. Again, those three were uh, areas of uh, robust public comment. And I think, um, Buffy, correct me if I'm wrong, but the THC limitation was the largest source of public comment that we received. That was the single largest group of the over 1,000 comments that we received. So six mature plants and six seedling plants uh, are, were added to the approved transaction amount. I mean, those, those are, will be available at dispensaries, the plants. And um, retain certain product labeling requirements, advising a potential risk to children and pregnant women but no longer requires labels to contain certain patient, physician, or dispensing in, uh, individual information. It clarifies that uh, minors are not prohibited from using nebulizers or other aeros or aerosolized medical devices, and smokable or vaporized products must have two physicians agree that it is medically necessary for the minor. Again, as I've uh, discussed, we removed all references to the dispensary manager, uh, places the responsibility of the dispensary manager upon the dispensary as a whole. Uh, limitations on hours of operation, again, were removed entirely. Uh, removes the prohibition on dispensaries uh, co-locating co with other commercial establishments. Removes the limitation that commercial establishments may only sell medical marijuana and medical, mar uh, medical marijuana products. Um, again, that was a, they can sell t-shirts. That's what you want, you know, that's what that means. Removes limitation on sale of items bearing a symbol or a reference or referencing marijuana or medical marijuana products. Still prohibits commercial establishments from uh, manufacturing or selling medical marijuana and medical marijuana products that are intentionally attractive to children or minors, but revises the language of that prohibition. So for instance, Candied, pro candied edibles, gummy edibles, uh, can be uh, manufactured and sold. They just can't be market marketed or packaged in such a way that makes them attractive to children. Um, again, as I said, uh, licensed dispensaries can sell marijuana seedlings and mature plants. So, again, changes were made to requirements of inventory tracking, records, reports, and audits of commercial entities. That provides that the department may conduct audits and inspect the books and records to ensure the accuracy of the monthly reports. We can, uh, we requires commercial licensees to provide the department access to their books and records in a reasonable amount of time, not to exceed 15 days. Requires the department to disclose criminal activity discovered uh, during an audit to law enforcement. Uh, composition of the, uh, the Food Safety Board was revised. It clarifies the standards uh, for handling and processing medical marijuana in accordance with existing rule and statute. Clarifies the qualification of the Food Safety Standards Boards and adds that the, lex the selection of qualified candidates is not li limited to the specified organizations, but that's just a list that we may, a list that we may choose from and adds the designee of any Oklahoma public health agency to the list of organizations um, and changes the deadline for the promulgation of the food safety standards to August 27th, 2018 as required by the state question. So again, um, some important dates. As you know, state, the state question was passed on June 26th. Within 30 days, um, it, we were required to have application requirements and instructions available on the OMMA website. Uh, for patients, caregivers, growers, processors, and dispensaries. We have, uh, we have satisfied that deadline and we, like again, we were, uh, came, 
and a little late on the food safety board, but hope to get that name today. Um, by August 25th, uh, we have to be able to receive applications through an online system, uh, and OMMA reviews and processes applications um, by, the on the by the next business day, which is the 27th. Um, the, the statutory deadline falls on a, on a Saturday. Food safety standards recommended by, by, by the board and made available. And so within 14 days of August 25th or September 10th, our first approval or denial of letters and licenses will be mailed to applicants. And we are, again, on target to meet those deadlines. Some future uh, rulemaking time frames for your consideration. Uh, the emergency rules signed by the governor on August 6th must undergo additional promulgation activities through the permanent rulemaking process. Uh, the permanent rulemaking process will include a, a public comment period. Permanent rules must be submitted to the legislature for approval by April 1st of next year. The next final action on the rule would occur during the 2019 regular legislative session. Uh, due to changes to, to the governance structure of the OSDH uh, and the Board of Health, the promulgation of agency rules uh, would be will be initiated by the Commissioner of Health uh, after the Board of Health becomes an advisory body in January of next year. So the impact of potential or legal or legislative action I would just ask you to remember and keep in mind that any changes that you make uh, legislatively or uh, we still have some lawsuits pending um, could delay implementation or at least we would need some, some lead time to implement uh, those statutory changes. And that could result obviously in changing our IT process which could, could it, uh, result in additional cost in that area. Um, so again, just keep in mind that statutory changes to current law as passed would Im impact the program. Uh, OSDH is continuing to work to implement the program within the framework and timelines of the state question and the emergency rules. Here is uh, the final slide, and that's our contact information. And so I would, uh, I know we're going into, uh, I know Senator, you said you want to take a break after the presentation, and this, so that in includes the the presentation and will obviously be available for your questions, but I would like to conclude the presentation by saying that I have, I have maintained and, and continue to maintain that we are, the, the Department of Health is ready to implement the state question as it currently stands. And we are, we've, we've been working diligently to do that and we'll continue to do that. But I would also say that from a public health standpoint, um, we would uh, more than welcome uh, some additional guidance uh, and structure on those areas that we discussed regarding um, uh, lab testing, uh, packaging and labeling and recall, and also some, uh, some additional clarification about the department's rulemaking authority in those arenas. So um, those, uh, those areas, um, like I said, we would, we would welcome uh, legislative action in those areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Bates. Uh, we will take a, uh, well, it's 10.03, so we're going to take a 12-minute break. Y'all can sprint to get your watermelon. I will tell you where to get it. I looked it up here. Okay, today is the Rush Springs Watermelon Feed at the Capitol. Rush Springs Lions Club and Washita Packaging are uh, sponsoring this event along with Senator Paul Scott. From 9 to 11 o'clock, you can get watermelon in room 419A. So, you now have 11 minutes <laughs> to get some watermelon. Uh, also, I, I very much encourage if, uh, if the members of the committee have not had a chance uh, to look over 
uh, everything that we were handed by the department and be prepared to ask uh, some, some very good questions. With that, uh, we will be on break until 10.15. This is time of question and answers. Uh, I very much encourage the members of the committee to uh, ask all of the questions they have, uh, learn everything that we can learn. Uh, at the same time, I really hope we're not here at one o'clock today. Uh, like we were, or like y'all were last week. So, uh, before we get into questions, I know uh, Commissioner introduced all of the members of the panel over here, uh, but if you guys wouldn't mind going through and introducing yourselves uh, once again, uh, more than anything so the people at home can get a clue on who is who. Uh, and also, I, I would be interested to know um, most of you are employees of the Medical Marijuana Authority, which has not really existed for very long, so I'd love to know where you came from uh, and what you were doing before you got into the Medical Marijuana Authority. So uh, if you guys would introduce yourselves and also uh, want to remind you, please speak into the microphones. You'll be sharing microphones, pass them back and forth. Uh, and through the rest of this meeting, if you're the one answering a question, no matter how many times you have identified yourself, identify yourself before you speak. Uh, as people who are trying to listen but can't see uh, each face, that's the only way that they can know who it is that's answering each question. So uh, with that, if, if you'd introduce yourselves and we'll get into questions. Tom Bates, Interim Commissioner of Health. Brian Downs, Chief of Staff of the State Health Department. Melissa Miller, Communications Manager for OMMA. Adrian Rollins, I am the Policy and Planning and Partnerships Director. Alicia Harris, the Patient Service Manager, OSDH. Buffy Heater, I'm the Chief of Data Public Policy um, and Promotion at the State Department. Derek Pate, I'm the Director of the Center for Health Statistics at the State Health Department. Spencer Cousy, I'm the Agency Policy Coordinator at the State Health Department. Nicole Nash, I'm a staff attorney at the Oklahoma State Department of Health. Thank you all very much. Senator, before we get into questions, uh, Nicole pointed out a couple of errors <laughs> or misstatements that I made. Nicole, do you want to point those out? Sure. Uh, there was a statement that um, the rules prohibit advertising to 21 and under or um, and that's actually to minors. We, ch we changed that 21 to under 18. Um, and then uh, there was a bullet point that kind of... Could, could you uh, get a little closer to the microphone, please? Yes. So sorry. Um, and then there was uh, also implication that we may have removed the requirement for a bona fide physician-patient relationship, and that is not accurate. We still require uh, that standard. So a face-to-face -face physician-patient visit is required like i said it was the follow-up visits uh that were that were removed from the rules just to, cl just to clarify that thank thank you very much so all right we will uh, open it up to questions representative west hey, thanks for coming in commissioner I, and i know you weren't here with the problems with uh and, and we, a lot of us were either but we got to blame for a lot of stuff but um so it's no secret that we've had have some problems with within the department of health if I gave you truth serum today, do you truly feel that the department can handle on taking on this task? Or do you think that, you know, it should be a, a whole new agency that implements this? I, I absolutely believe that we can handle it. I mean, we've, we've been handling it, Representative. I'm not saying that to be, you know, with bravado or to be um, uh, with any kind of braggadocia in my voice. I mean, we've, you know, these people that I've introduced and others there's, as I tell people, there, there are PhDs and masters in public health tucked throughout the, uh, the uh, health department who do the work of public health and protecting public health every day. That had nothing to do with what went on um, with the financial issues. Mm -hmm. And I, I have encouraged them to, um, you know, really seize the moment here and look at this as, a, as an opportunity to demonstrate their ability and competence to you all. And I think, and I think I've done, that they've done that and are doing that. Now, that being said, I think, I think there is a policy consideration about whether the, uh, 
the, the regulation of medical marijuana is best housed in the Department of Health from a policy standpoint. Our, our mission is to protect public health and to, um, and to work on issues like tobacco cessation and obesity and um, uh, newborn screening for uh, 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 birth defects and, and all those things that people kind of take for granted that, that are the core mission of, of public health um, is is this counter to that in some way? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to opine on that, but I think it is something for, that needs to be discussed and considered. For and I, and I, would, I would like to you know, give some of the team the opportunity to speak to that issue, if, if they may. And I'm looking at you, Buffy. <laughs> um. You are right. I mean, Commissioner, when you speak to the mission of the health department, um, we are here to protect the public's health, to promote the betterment of health, and to improve the state's health outcomes. So to the extent that um, anything that is under the health department's purview um, aligns with that mission and allows us to continue to move the needle in the state, I think that makes sense. Um, where it's a little bit of a one-off or perhaps not a good fit, I think that's where the commissioner is um, encouraging there to be some additional assessment and consideration on that point. But with that being said, if, if, it, is the, if it is the will of, of, of the legislature that it stay in the, in the Department of Health, we'll, we'll do the job and do it well. Follow up. Yeah, so back to, and this was kind of went back to uh, last week, talking to the other groups that were here, for monitoring, and I don't know if you address it or not, but do you, or should we use the PMP? Or if, if not, which, which system would you put in place to be able to monitor prescriptions? Well, I think, I think the PMP model is, is, is the model. I think there needs to be something that allows, um, you know, from a policy standpoint, changes to that provision to require the, um, the inclusion of, of cannabis in, 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 that, in, in that so that physicians get the full picture of what the patient may be, may be using or be, being, being prescribed as they make these decisions. And I think that's a, a, that's a public safety issue and a public health no. concern. Representative Fettgetter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, all of you that are here today for all the hard work you've put into this, I know it's been difficult and challenging. It's been difficult, challenging for us too, right? So it's all new and so we'll get through it. But uh, I have a couple of questions here. Um, uh, can you explain the, the, the requirement to register with uh, OBNDD and uh, what that entails and as, as well as isn't that going to add additional requirements um, for inspection and DEA registration? I'm going to ask Buffy to weigh in on this too because we, we did get a question on that after the revised rules. But you know, that OBN, I think we have to keep in mind marijuana is still a scheduled substance. And so there are existing laws that govern that and OBN registration is, is, is one of those. So until there is some change, to, to address those issues, then th that people will need to comply with, with existing law. And that's what we've said. Now that, what, what's, in, what's involved with OBN registration and how it impacts um, uh, you know, fees and, and practice and operations, like I said, we've, we've done some checking into that. And Buffy, why don't you um, tell them what you've learned. Sure, absolutely. So we have been in talks with um, staff from OBNDD because because we too have been learning more about how these two processes would work together. Um, what we did learn that in the existing statute uh, that is uh, that is governing who must secure an OBNDD registration, um, that is uh, that is a registration with OBNDD that comes after a commercial entity would apply for licensure with the medical marijuana program. As Commissioner did speak to, the, the simple fact that the, per, that the entity is dealing with the Schedule I substance, um, that is what triggers, uh, to my understanding, the next, uh, the next requirement for that OBND registration. So one of the specific questions that we were asked is that there is a prevailing belief out there that 
in order for an entity to be OBNDD registered that it does require registration also with DEA. We've confirmed with OBNDD that is, that is not the case. So an OBNDD registration on its own does not also require a commercial entity to register with DEA. There's actually an, uh, uh, an option on the OBNDD application that is in A um, that OBND has indicated to us that would be the check mark that the uh, commercial entities would need to select. Um, OBNDD is also revising and providing some additional instruction on their website for the commercial entities that are out, um, out there looking for this type of information to be able to draw attention to that fact. So I think the main thing to remember here is that OBNDD registration does not also require a DEA registration um, okay. for commercial entities. Follow up. So one of my concerns is um, on the, uh, the uh, September 10th date is when we, we begin issuing those first licenses, correct? correct. It's my understanding that, that this, this, o, this OBNDD part doesn't even become effective till November 1st, which is going to further delay the implementation um, for commercial operators to be able to open. Am I correct or am I missing something? So I'm not aware of a November 1st uh, uh, genesis date uh, that would that would govern that. It's our understanding that the state statute is currently in existence, and so I've not heard, I'm not aware of the November 1st start date. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator Yak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Bates, thank you and your group for what you do. I was part of a group back during session that met proactively, and I think we met with you, I don't know, April sometime just before we adjourned. You had an aggressive timeline back then. You. Uh, at that point, we didn't know what the question was going to do, obviously, but you were stepping up back then, and I appreciate that. So you've shown that from the very get-go, and kudos to you for that. A couple questions, and I'm going to bounce around here a little bit, so you can take these questions, or you can pass them on if you'd like. Um, regarding the executive director, do you have a timeline for that? And then I have a follow-up to that question. Again, as I said, I think I'm going to... We're going to get past this, this August 25th and September 10th deadline, and then we'll we'll revisit that at that point. And if 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 there is some additional information or thoughts about um, from this group that come from this group about direction, uh, you know that may play into that. But um, if not, then I'm, I would think you know mid September we'll be we'll be looking at making a decision there. So regarding that position, have you developed some guidelines or some qualifications that you're looking for? For that role, we have, and um, you know, the position was posted with a uh, with a detailed, you know, job description and a set of qualifications. Uh, I know Buffy did uh, a lot of work in vetting those candidates that we that we did talk to. Do you want to elaborate on on that process at all? Sure. So, in terms of qualifications, um, from an educational standpoint, we were looking at someone um, with preference for an advanced degree. Um, so masters, we also um, understood that sometimes there are some clinical specialties that may have interest in being able to come in, uh, as well as attorneys or folks with JDs. Um, as far as the skills to carry out the job, this the director is in essence overseeing uh, about a half dozen managers in different functional areas. So we want there to be strong team lead orientation, um, ability to motivate, ability to deliver under pressure, um, and also uh, to be able to adequately communicate not only with their internal team, but also be that face or be that, that outward um, facing presence to be able to answer inquiries, attend hearings, and uh, to be able to carry out some of those activities. You mentioned there would be reports to the pro tem and the speaker. Those reports would come from both that group or that position eventually, or would that come from from them through you to those? Well, initially, like I said, uh, we committed to providing uh, monthly updates, um, not only about OMM, about our uh, medical marijuana expenditures, but just our, our progress surrounding our financial situation, the transition to PeopleSoft and things like that. So those will be coming from me um, uh, initially. Uh, to, to those, uh, to the pro tem and the speaker. And, you know, at that, after, at some point, as it regard, as it comes to um, medical marijuana or OMMA specifically, uh, we may, um, you know, I may hand that off to, to that person. Follow up on uh, slide 15, if you would refer to that. Sure. 
The second point there you refer to, this is regarding physicians, accepted standards. So we're all new to this whole process. So how do you define at this point? Have those been developed yet? Or are there some industry standards when it comes to what those th accepted think, standards are going forward? How do they know? And I think that's, um, you know, that was one of the issues, frankly, that we, that we wrestled with in this rulemaking process. And um, we, we determined that, you know, basically in, in, in medical, in, in the medical field, that there's a standard of care that, that, um, that applies uh, to physicians, doctors, and DOs as they treat patients and, and prescribe medicines. Um, even though this isn't a, a prescription in the truest sense, it is a recommendation for, a, for medical marijuana. So, again, based on the limited uh, rulemaking authority uh, that we have, you know, it was determined that was, for, for now, it's, it's got to be that industry, that industry standard that governs reasonable and prudent medical practice. And that's, that's where we are. Again, you know, as I've said a couple of times in, in my time at OSDH, I think it's important uh, that people in state government stay in their lanes. And that, and that uh, I think OSDH needs to stay in its lane. So to the extent the medical licensure boards, whether it be the, the, the medical board or the osteopathic board wants to delve into rulemaking and standards surrounding medical marijuana, I, mean, I think that's, you know, maybe it may be a worthy exercise for them, but that, I don't think that that's something that, that we as the Department of Health can do. Follow up, kind of leads to another follow up. So that's a requirement in that term. It's required that physician use accepted standards. So accepted standards is pretty vague at this point. So I don't know how you can require somebody to follow standards that are vague. So that's, I understand that's, that's kind of work in progress. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you would, to a physician, it may not be vague though. I'll say that. I mean, there are accepted standards of, of practice when it comes to making those decisions that they know. So it, those, those standards, I, I, I would just have to defer to, to the medical community on that. Okay, fair enough. So that makes me think, you said you've communicated with some of the other states. 788, 788 it's very unique, as, I, as I'm told, as far as medical marijuana laws are concerned. So that kind of makes it tough to kind of learn from experiences. And I hope this group going forward is able to hear from, I don't know if we could Skype or bring them in, but I'd like to hear from some point, some of those other groups, people that have gone th down this road before. but. I think that, that is some challenges for you guys as you go forward in this rulemaking process to try to learn from what's already happened in other states. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit. It is, and I would ask Alicia to speak to that. She is, Alicia has led the effort to communicate with uh, other states and their, get their experiences and the benefit of their knowledge, and she can let us know what, what that has yielded. So yes, we did. We've spent a lot of time speaking with other states. Um, we focused mostly on speaking with states that have actually gone through rules changes. They've gone through the process of implementing the program. Uh, we've talked to states in our region, such as Arkansas, New Mexico, Arizona. Arizona has been extremely helpful. Uh, and they will be visiting us soon to offer additional assistance. Although our state question is very unique, there are some uh, similarities in the sense of the implementation, um, you know, how licenses are issued some of the challenges that other states faced. So we did speak with them about those challenges and just asked for assistance um, as much as they could offer. And that's been helpful to you to talk to them? Very that's been helpful. helpful to you. And we are continuing those conversations. Okay, great. And one last question, Mr. Chairman. I tried to jot down the numbers as you read them off, the different areas uh, that you're budgeting. So what was, the t what was the total estimated cost? Do you have that number? Approximately four and a half million dollars is what we're at for um, for all of those different categories that the commissioner spoke to in his presentation. That's for the initial implementation. That's not necessarily an annual estimated ongoing cost, right? That's the initial. That's what you're. That's considering. correct. That's primarily startup. And so, into that point, one of the things I, I wanted I failed to mention during the presentation was this has been a little more expensive on the staffing side because of the 14 day turnaround on the processing. So that means we've had to hire more people to do the work quickly. So um, it's about 40, 40 staff um, all together again to get in there and so we can turn those things around in 
uh, during the, the prescribed time period. So again, that's, uh, that time period has, has driven some of our um, costs there. Um, you know, no plan. Is, we're going to have to see how this evolves over time and how many applications we actually do get and if, if our estimates are accurate. If not, then we'll have to, we'll have to adjust accordingly. Representative Bush. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all. As uh, one with a public health background, I appreciate you saying that you all need to stay in your lane. I think that's really important going forward, and I, I appreciate the work that you've done on this. So as far as the budget question, I have a couple of questions, and I'm going to be all over the board like my colleague here. Um, so the Medical Marijuana Authority is now under you all. Is that my understanding correct? So you initially funded the four and a half million because obviously there were no taxes or fees to cover those costs, right? So yeah, where's the money coming from? Well, again, you know, it's uh, the, the department's financial, uh, the lack of clarity around the, the, the department's financial picture and the, uh, the supplemental uh, appropriation that was given and as the, as the reports have, that came out from the multi-county grand jury and the auditor's office indicated that those, that those funds uh, likely were not needed and those funds are available. And again, that's part of the communication we've had with the speaker's office is to make sure that, that they know we are, you know, we're not planning, uh, we haven't gone into our budget planning for the new fiscal year considering that $30 million in any way. Um, but I did say on the, on the day after the election that absent any guidance from the legislature, we would, we would use that money um, to set up this program. So that's, that's where the money's coming from. Okay. Okay. I'll leave that subject for right now. Um, my head is spinning on that one. Okay. Slide 18, you talked about um, the uh, changes to the requirements on inventory tracking, and it requires the department to disclose criminal activity discovered during an audit to the law enforcement. What are examples that you're looking for in those criminal activities? I mean, are you talking about black market, stuff going out the back door? What are you all looking for? A lack of documentation that would indicate diversion. The product was being diverted uh, for, for an illegal purpose. Okay. And that's, that's what that's about. Okay, and then my last question um, is back on 17 that has to do with limitation of solve items. So for lack of knowledge on this, so when I go into a dispensary, am I gonna be able to buy a pipe and a bong or do I have to go somewhere else to do that? Uh, that was one of the changes that were made to the rule. So accessories and products and other ancillary um, needs will be available. Uh, there's no prohibition on those other products being sold um, at a particular commercial entity. Okay. Thank you all very much. Representative Loring. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you kind of answered questions I had on the current fiscal situation there, but moving forward, and I know we're going to only be dealing with projections, uh, but do you all feel that the tax that is set in 78, 788 is sufficient to cover the costs for you or whoever is going to be handling the system in the future? I, you know, there's, there's two sources of revenue under the state question. There's the, there's the fees the, um, and, the, uh, and then the taxes. The, I, I've always, we've kind of kept our estimates about budget around what we would know. And that's, you know, based on other states with similar populations that have gone, undergone these types of programs, what is the number of patient applications and commercial applications that we would, that we would receive. And I think, 
the fees coming off of those applications, again, based on our best estimates, would be sufficient to sustain the health department's cost of the program. Buffy, you want to? Caveat being, if our estimates are correct, right? right. So I mean, we're looking at uh, eighty thousand total applications is our best estimate right now. About two thousand of those, up to two thousand being commercial entities, and the other seventy-eight thousand being patient applications that will be received in the first year. Remember, there's a there's a significant fee difference. Um, commercial entities are at twenty-five hundred dollars for their app, uh, the license fee, um, and then on the individual side. Um, that's at most $100 for the patient license, but remember if they are sooner care qualified here in the state, then their uh, fee drops to $20. And so the question about what happens with the, the funds generated from tax revenue, I guess, you know, we, to be frank, we just haven't really spent a lot of time grappling with that issue because we've just been focused on setting up the, on setting up the program. So, I mean, I think that is, you know, it's something to be, it definitely needs something uh, to be looked at. I mean, we, we've had conversations with the tax commission about their willingness to facilitate the collection of those revenues and, and all of that, and they've been, they've been very helpful in those discussions. But projecting that out and what that looks like, um, I don't know. And I, think, and I think one of the reasons that it is hard to figure that, frankly, is you know, we don't know what the, what the impact of the home grow provision is when it comes to tax revenue and how many people will, will take advantage of that versus, uh, you know, go to, go to a dispensary. So I just think that's, there's just some unknowns there. Follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, somewhat related to that, a question that came in my mind is with regards to a caretaker license, if you have a homebound individual can they have more than one caretaker that would be required to get a license under these rules? No, a patient can only have one. Would you please identify oh, yourself? I'm sorry, I'm Melissa Miller. A patient can only have one licensed caregiver. However, a, an individual may be a caregiver for multiple patients. There's no limit on how many patients they can be a caregiver for. Follow up? Yes, thank you. So on, uh, uh, Slide 15, uh, I understand that you, in, in the revised rules, we've removed the provision regarding uh, pregnancy or, or women of childbearing age. Um, I'd like to back up just a little bit from that. Can you give me some, some of the thought process that went into that be, being a part of the original rules? Why was that in there? And is there any research-based uh, reasons for that to be there? You want to speak to that, Buffy? Sure. So um, I can't speak directly to the actual reasons why that was um, included in the original version um, of the rule. I can speak, however, to the second part of that that speaks to the research. So um, what we have learned is that um, for marijuana products, um, there is impact that, closet, that crosses um, the blood barrier to the baby um, as that baby is, uh, is, uh, is in utero. Um, we have uh, understood that from, uh, there is some mi mixed evidence, right? So it's not uh, demonstrable, but there is mixed evidence that uh, does speak to potential impact um, of the effects of marijuana on IQ in uh, young children and, and developing, uh, developing children. And so I believe those were some of the reasons that we wanted to make sure that the doctor-patient relationship was something that was being supported and that we wanted to make sure that that conversation was happening between the consumers and the physician um, so that everyone would be knowledgeable of if indeed there was a potential pregnancy or a pregnancy that was in place um, and allowing that doctor and, and patient to have that conversation about potential risks and then make a decision on um, what the best course of treatment would be thereafter. Follow up. Thank you. So would it be fair to say that that um, part of the original rules was removed because of public pressure? I would think it's fair to say it was removed because it was determined that the, that the board did not have the authority to make rules in that area as outlined by the state question. So I think that was, that was the, the reason 
for the rule for the rule change. Representative Fetgetter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I've got three questions that I'm going to roll it all up into one, but before I do that with a little leniency, um, I mentioned the uh, November 1st date earlier. That, that was a piece of legislation ran in the 2018 session, so the enacting clause, there wasn't an emergency on it, so that's where the November 1st date comes from. Um, with that being said, um, in some of your remarks, in the opening remarks, you talked about, um, you mentioned the need for additional uh, legislation um, uh, for commercial licensing. Um, w when we look at the, the new rules, we took out, you know, testing labs and labeling and all of, all of these things. And um, so I'm just curious, do you believe that um, the department has the authority to fully implement this safely um, without the legislature creating the, some other framework around those issues? I, mean, I think we have the ability to fully implement the state question. You, you, asked, you, you put in the caveat of safely. So I am, so I, those, those issues, those three issues that I mentioned or uh, that have been developed, those, those concern me as, as the commissioner of health. And I think they concern uh, the department as a whole and the experts uh, that are in the department. So those, those issues around testing and again, what people uh, will, be, will be ingesting, making sure that those, those, that material is safe and free of contaminants. Um, yes, that is that that concerns us as the agency charged with protecting public health, and so that's you know those concerns um, will not uh, as state question seven eighty eight is written, and as we go into the fall and issuing licenses and, and businesses go on, come on board. Um, I, sp I spent 12 years, uh, I spent six, almost 16 years in the AG's office, but 12 years of that as a, as a prosecutor in the Consumer Fraud Division, okay? And so I, I know a little bit about the importance of disclosures to consumers and things like that and what that means to public safety. And so we will be going into a, into a buyer beware environment, okay? That's, you know... And so that's one of the things that um, is Tony Sellers here, still here, that I've you know charged Tony. I'm, Tony, I'm sorry I didn't introduce you earlier. Tony's our director of communications and been doing a great job on this. But you know we, we're going to have to develop a robust uh, system or or bunch of consumer education materials. Uh, you know that that consumers need to go ask when they go into a dispensary. Um, about about the product and its origins and things like that. We're going to have to. One of the things the Department of Health is going to have to do is that consumer education piece. All right. Follow up. Are you aware of any other states that have been successful with rolling out a program similar to this if they don't have labs and testing spelled out initially? All of the other states that we talked with have labs in place that test product, and they have requirements of some sort. So no, we're not familiar. We haven't spoken with any other states that have done that. Thank you. Welcome. Birthday boy, Paxton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Commissioner, one thing about when I was named on this committee, um, multiple friends, I'm sure every committee member here deals with it, you get lots of jokes and puns about serving on this committee. When Senator McCourtney mentioned there was watermelon downstairs, I had a text from a friend who supported 788 that was questioning if it was marijuana watermelon. <laughs> and, and so we get that all the time. And I keep telling people, I say, I can joke back with you and enjoy that, but there's a lot of serious issues, and I thank you for what you all are doing. Um, it is a, uh, it's a big deal, and I think you all have made, made tremendous strides and given us some ideas. One thing I keep repeating at every one of these meetings is my concern about public safety and workplace safety as it relates with 788. 
On slide number 10, it talks a little bit about the employers. And in the first bullet on there, it talks about an employer may not discriminate and specifically the results of a drug test showing positive for marijuana. Um, a question I had of presenters the last two weeks was, would an employer be able to, say, say a crane operator? You know, there's certain medications they just can't be on and be a crane operator. Under the under 788 right now, it looks like to me what I'm reading is if they're testing for THC in a, in a blood test or something, they couldn't penalize that employee for having that in their system. Is that correct? You know, I haven't, you know, issues are surrounding employment. Again, that's kind of, kind of comes back to staying in our lane at the health department. Um, I, I, think, I think it's a valid concern. I, I, I don't know what courts would do or how employers are, are going to handle that and, and they're, you know, how they're going to apply other policies regarding substances um, you know, in the workplace. But those are all things that, that are areas of concern and, and need to be, definitely need to be fleshed out. Thank you. Um, the response I had last two weeks was you know, from, the, from the advocacy groups was they thought that the employer had the ability to um, hire and fire whoever that they wanted to. So it looks like to me there may be some clarification that needs to be taken care of in here. So we'll, that's probably something down the road the legislature will have to look at. The other question I had was this week I had traveled to a uh, elementary school and was speaking to the teachers there. The superintendent had a question about um, what about students that may have the medical marijuana license under whatever curriculum they, they would have to have. Are schools required to dispense that the same way they, they would with prescription medication? Has that been addressed? Has that been talked about? I'm not aware that it's been addressed. So again, it's one of those many issues that will that needs to be be looked at. And a follow up on that, Mr. Chairman, the the question from the superintendent and the, t the teachers I was talking to was, are they going to be in a you know, is there a potential this fall when school starts back, if somebody gets one of those licenses, would they possibly be in a situation where there's not clarity on what they can and can't? dispense as far as, you know, the office dispensing medication to students with that. It sounds like that may be a, an area that needs to be addressed relatively quickly. I would, yes, I mean, it's, it's I mean, I think each, um, again, not speaking uh, for educators or the education community, I think each, each school district will have to, as they go into the fall, will have to sit down with their council and decide how they're, how they're going to handle that situation get the, and, and make the best, best determination they can on the information they currently have. Okay. Uh, follow up. The, uh, on slide 17, and this is just kind of just for, for clarity, it's talking about the dispensaries and um, removes limitation that commercial establishments may only sell medical marijuana and medical marijuana products. Just on the places these places can go, can it say an existing retail store start a section in it that's a, that's a dispensary or do they have to be their own standalone shops inside, say, a strip mall or something? I'll speak to that, Nicole. Yeah, the, the provisions prohibiting co-location of businesses has been removed, so they are not prohibited. <laughs> Sorry, Nicole Nash, staff attorney. Um, in the original draft, of rules, there was a provision that prohibited co-location of businesses that has been removed. So there is no longer a prohibition on uh, such co-location. So, sorry. So it's it's wide open. Okay, it's 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 you know, it's wide open. You know, who can take a some square footage of of their biz of their current existing business and dedicate that to a, a dispensary right now? Okay, thank you, Representative Rosecrans. Well, first of all, thank you all very much for being here and for the hard work you've done on this. Uh, I know you've taken some, <laughs> some pretty big hits in the public uh, over the last few weeks, and uh, my question actually is going to have to do with some of that. Uh, there are many uh, citizens who took major issue with some of the early uh, emergency rules changes. I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, for instance, THC percentage, pharmacist mandate, pregnancy test, uh, banning smokables, those types of things. Yet in the document, uh, potential statute change recommendations as received from interagency partners, I see that those have been put back in. Can you explain why these have been included in this list? Okay. 
just to clarify, th those were a list of concerns about state question 788 that we received about from, from agent, other agencies that as suggestions for the legislature to look at. Okay, now some of those, you know, by statute, statutory changes. Now some of those issues, uh, you know, were, were included in the initial draft of, of the rules and then removed after we got guidance from the Attorney General. So, I mean, that's, there's nothing, it's, those are, you know, the medical licensure community, your law enforcement community, your education community, those are all concerns that they have about, that they articulated about state question 788 as it is. We, we present that for your consideration. Thank you very much to follow up. Yes. Um, I have opened myself up to my constituents uh, within my district and with, uh, outside of it. I've got a ton of questions and a lot of them are very specific and I've been kind of wondering who do I go to with these specific questions and I, I think it's the OMMA since that is <laughs> the Oklahoma Medical Marijuana Agency. So um, I've got so many and I'm not going to take up your time otherwise we will be here till you know four o'clock in, in the afternoon. But I do want to know one thing, um, a few things actually, but uh, this question came out a bunch. Why um, do we want to make sure that it is indoor growing only, not outdoor growing? And that's from farmers and everybody else involved in this. Well, again, that was a provision that was in the initial draft and it was removed. The feedback that we got initially was that for purposes of, again, you know, tracking lawful, you know, there were, there was some law enforcement concern about, uh, uh, again, how, how do you distinguish a legal grow from an illegal grow? And the best, it, it was there, some of the feedback that we got that was that indoor grow uh, or a, that limitation was the best way. And in fact, I think that that is other states mandate that. I mean, that is the practice in other states. But again, you know, we, the Attorney General said that was beyond the scope of the, of the authority granted the Board of Health by the state question and it was removed. But I mean, but there are legitimate policy considerations about the indoor grow versus the outdoor grow. And, and follow up to that, I mean, I've, I've kind of thought the same thing. I figured since this is medical, I, I would imagine, and, and it's what I told some of my constituents, that it would be a control, it, you could control it better for, for medicinal purposes. And that's kind of what I posited. Would you agree with that? Well, I think for, for a lot of reasons, uh, for tracking and, and, and the distinction between what's, what's, a, what's a legal grow versus a, a, maybe an, an illegal grow. But I think one of the other issues, in, and we've had a, a lot of discussion about seed to sale and, and what that means and how other states are using that to track it. And I think those are all good discussions and discussions that the legislature needs to have. But I, I think that we would need to keep in mind um, that with the, uh, the, what the state question allows on the home grow side, how does that impact seed to sale and tracking? We, we could invest a lot of money um, in, in a seed to sale tracking system to prohibit you know, diversion and things like that, but that could all, you know, but what is that, you know, how does the home grow component impact that? And so just all things that need to be considered. Well, thank you. Um, do I, can I have one more question? I appreciate it. This is just an overall question to open to the whole panel. Um, what about Arizona made it the most attractive? You said they've worked with you most. What about Arizona's program? Uh, a few things were most attractive about that. Uh, well, predominantly Arizona has a very streamlined system. So all of their application processes are online. Uh, which is how they saved a lot of money when they implemented. They um, have a similar um, makeup in the sense of their population. Also, they have a um, similar uh, setup as far as their uh, mix of political views, if you will. Uh, and so they were able to share a lot of knowledge with us about how they managed implementing their program, dealing with some of the the uh, issues that they faced from the constituents, you know, their legislature dealt with a lot of issues there. Uh, they shared a lot of those experiences, but primarily it was how they implemented their system online. 
how they streamline their program. They have 162,000 residents that are currently on their medical marijuana authority list. So they have a lot of experience with how to license and things like that. Thank you. Thank you all. Representative West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this kind of goes um, with Representative Bush and Representative Loring about funding the program and the actual tax. And this may be a question for the tax commissioner or the AG, but we, we don't tax pharmaceuticals in Oklahoma. And so I'm still confused on how, how can we legally tax this as medicine? And so do you see issues because we're going to be taxing uh, medicine? You know, I'm, I'm not a tax expert. And um, I, I'm, I'm going to defer all those questions to the tax commission. Okay. I mean, that's, that's what the state question allows. That's what it provides for. But those, those questions around what can be taxed and what should be taxed, um, we'll defer to, to the commission and, and to you all. Okay. Representative Copeland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, a question I have, you, you went into some specifics on your executive director position, and you're talking about your uh, food safety board could you elaborate a little bit about how you chose those individuals and what process you went through to, to do that? So um, qualifications of the food safety board members were prescribed in, uh, in 788. Really, there were three major things. Number one is they had to be an Oklahoma resident. Number two, they had to demonstrate um, uh, being an industry expert in, uh, in medical marijuana. And number three with this, that they had to have you know, unique qualifications that um, gave them certain skills and ability to be able to speak to the development of guidelines on the processing and handling of medical marijuana. Those were the three very broad um, uh, parameters that were set forth for us to be able to then identify uh, the members of the Food Safety Board. Um, so in our, as our development efforts have proceeded, we've been able to establish relationships with, um, with new industry, with new stakeholders, um, as well as with folks that have been known to the public health agency for, for a long time. Whenever you look at the role of the State Department of Health, you know, we have food inspectors. There is a core function that we have an, a, a, um, you know, an element that has to go out and look at food manufacturers, restaurants, um, you know, food servers, things like that. So there was some um, existing relationships with some folks on the food industry side, but not necessarily the medical marijuana side. So we were really challenged with trying to find individuals that had had some experience or exposure to uh, marijuana topics specifically, and then trying to combine that with a food expert um, type skill, skill and talent. That's been a very difficult process to go through, um, considering it's a brand new industry, you know, here in Oklahoma. Uh, and quite frankly, I think some, um, because of the sensitivity and the controversy of the topic, there are professionals that were perhaps um, reluctant to come forward to be able to sit on this 12-member uh, board. Uh, but we've been working our best, right, to go through the networks that we have and also working with our, our newfound partners uh, in the industry to be able to help identify um, who those members may be. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Along that same line, uh, previous groups have testified about the, the medical knowledge or ability to prescribe uh, cannabis to patients and the lack of knowledge by the medical community about actually doing that. Is that a concern of, of y'all's? And why, you know, a concern for particularly rural folks is we don't really have doctors, we have PAs out there. Why did you limit it to doctors and not allow uh, physician's assistants to uh, sign off on the medical cards? Sure, so let me tackle the first part of that, um, which your question was really about. Uh, there's not a body of, of evidence or literature uh, that we would typically see with, within a medical community um, that would provide some guidelines around recommending standards, things like that. So we recognize that that's something that uh, that the scientific community uh, is working. You know, we're not, we're not the first state to have gone down this road. We know that there's, you know, what, 31 states that have gone uh, before us. And so we recognize from a scientific standpoint that body of literature is developing, and so it's something that I think we'll continue to look to our, um, you know, our, our medical schools and our licensure boards to learn and then to be able to advise us as the health department on what those best standards may be. 
On the second part of your question, uh, speaking about uh, it being physicians, so we were trying to look to the, uh, the plain language of the state question, which called for board certification. Uh, a board certified physician uh, is the one that is recommending these products. Um, whenever we were in talks with our medical licensure boards and trying to identify really what board certification meant, um, it did indicate that an MD and DO are, are, the, uh, are the, the, the clinical levels um, that are able to obtain that board certification. Um, so that's something that we were trying to be uh, in compliance with state question in its plain language. Follow up. Uh, another question, you brought up testing. So is it, is it my understanding that you do not feel like state question 788 gives you the authority in any way, shape, or fashion to, to develop any type of testing program? Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Another question, and it has, I haven't heard anyone speak of this, and it may, this is all going to be d domestic product, correct? State grown. As and, mandated by the state question. That's okay. correct. So there's no, there will be no reciprocal agreements for other states that have medical cannabis can bring their product in and sell it. It will all be domestic product. That's, That's correct. correct. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, one final question. Yes, sir. One statement was made in your presentation about uh, selling the product and says, you said not marketed in a way that makes it attractive to children. How do you, how do you determine that? How is that determination made? Who, who is this the board, the board will make that determination? I mean, I think it'll be based on if we, if we get complaints or become aware of something then we'll look at uh, taking some type of action, sending, you know, following up with the dispensary, making them aware of our concern, thing, uh, things like that. But you're right, it is, it is somewhat subjective, and that's why there, you know, we, it would probably be benefit to have some more detailed um, standards about what the marketing of this should look like. There are some models around tobacco um, that deal with marketing to children that could be helpful and adapted to, to medical marijuana, such as the use of cartoon figures and things, things of that nature that we know would, would attract children. But yes, it is, it is an area that could use more definition, for sure. One, uh, yes, my follow. concern is the, is the edible part of, that, of the product. I mean, that, that's going to be kind of hard to determine how it, you keep it from being attractive to children because they, you know, most small children won't pick up anything and eat it if they can get their hands on it most of the time. So, I mean, just because it's, I mean, saying it was, outlawing it, I guess, is the question that I'm, I'm getting at. How do you determine whether it's, it's one over that threshold? I mean, that that's pretty broad. It is, broad and like I said again, I mean, I think there. Are, there have been attempts to, to put some guardrails on those standards in other areas that might be useful. But again, you know, when, when children are present around, this, around these substances and items, you know, we're going to have to trust that people uh, in their homes will take the, the, the reasonable and necessary precautions to prevent that, just like you would with any, any medicine. All right. Uh, Everyone's had a chance to ask questions, so I'm, I have a few of you still on the list, but if it's okay with you, Commissioner, uh, the Chair, would like to ask a few questions here. Uh, one of the things, that, as you know, uh, the last two weeks we've spent uh, talking to groups who, who rode and, and really helped uh, get 788 passed. And one of the things that, that they talked about, which I was very happy to hear, is uh, a focus on the, the patient, the doctor-patient relationship and um, the idea that in the best case scenario is a doctor who's not only writing a recommendation, but a recommending uh, dosage, you know, how much you use, how you use it, uh, and, and a timeline. Uh, in the current rules and, and the computer system and everything else that you have done, are you prepared? Is there the ability, uh, if a physician says, I, I want to give you a recommendation for marijuana 
for 30 days, is there a 30-day license or is that person really going to be getting a, a two-year license? It's a two-year license, Senator, and that's because that's what the state question, uh, that's what the language requires. We've, we've in, in picking our um, IT provider for this, we've, we've tried to, you know, pick a system that had some flexibility for those kind of changes. So if, if we're adding, if we have the ability or if, or if there's legislation passed that requires that level of granularity in the, in the recommendation that we can accommodate that. But as, as it stands right now, it's a, it's a two year license. All right. And I mean, just, I guess to make sure I understand the answer. So if, if my doctor wrote me a, a script said, use marijuana 30 days, you know, this level of, you know, THC, this level of CBD, none of that gets translated onto a license. I, I'm just getting a blanket license to buy whatever kind at whatever quantity. Correct. Whatever, whatever quantity is allowed, that's allowable under the state question, that's, that's, what, that's what you get. Now, obviously, we would hope doctors would walk through some of those issues with patients and say what the best practices are for usage, dosage, you know, quantity, over what time period, things like that. But, but our ability to track will be just, like, there was a recommendation for a license, the license was issued. Thank you. Uh, moving to page 21 on your slides. Um, you mentioned pending lawsuits and basically it says pending lawsuits uh, may delay implementation. Uh, if you could kind of give us a refresher course on what lawsuits are, are still out there. I feel like some may have gone away with the new rules. Um, we have uh, two lawsuits pending, one in Oklahoma County and one in uh, Cleveland County. Uh, the one in Oklahoma County uh, addressed or was primarily directed at um, allegations concerning the Open Meetings Act from the July 10th board meeting. Um, and the one in Cleveland County actually got into certain uh, concerns about rules. Um, I, you know, I would, I would defer to the Attorney General's office. Those, those cases are still ongoing. We're, we're being, uh, the board and the department are being represented by the AG. In those cases, um, I would, it, was, it was my hope that the changes uh, to the rules uh, would, uh, would moot some of the issues out of the Cleveland County case, but we'll just have to see how that litigation process goes forward. Thank you. And on slide number nine, uh, to your recommendations, three, the three, uh, I guess, top recommendations coming from the department, they um, have to do with laboratory testing, the inability to recall, uh, and the lack of packaging and labeling. I was accused in the last meeting of setting up straw men. Uh, so I would like to just ask you, what if we don't fix these, what happens? Senator, as I said earlier, I, th I think we go into the, the, the start of this program in a, in a, in a buyer beware, uh, kind of a wild west scenario where um, it's gonna be up to consumers to go in and ask very detailed and specific questions about the product, the origins of the product, if it, when, what kind of testing has been done, uh, and things like that. And um, that's what happens with that. Um, you know, I think there is some concern um, that about adulterated product and you know and when i say you know things with pesticides or or whatever it's just that's a that's a concern until until you have specifically those kind of testing standards um out there that everybody agrees on everybody knows the playing field you know these are the requirements and so forth buffy do you want to elaborate on that at all i know you've spent some time looking at that issue so the only thing that I would add is, uh, I echo first what uh, Commissioner has said on 
on that, uh, those being very important from a public health perspective and from a public safety perspective. Um, but I would say that uh, from the health department standpoint, we're certainly open to continuing to learn more uh, about these standards. So we, as Alicia has talked about, we've um, begun to engage and dialogue with other states on what their testing requirements look like. Um, we've also been contacted by uh, some uh, potential, you know, vendors or labs that are doing other areas, other lines of business in the state that, that they too want to learn more. And so I think it would be a healthy opportunity to have an open discussion and a dialogue about what that framework looks like moving forward. So we make sure that um, we're hearing all voices at the table, industry as well as the scientific experts. Thank you. Representative Fettgetter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just have two areas where I'd like to just get some clarification. Um, Representative Rosecrantz brought up um, the outdoor grow. Um, when we look at outdoor grow, we, we look at pesticides, um, you know, spider mites, white flies, mold issues, fungus issues that can transfer to be transferred to human through this medication. Um, are we talking about, uh, maybe I missed it, when you, when you took out the indoor grow only, was that for commercial and home grow or just for home grow? I mean, can you grow commercially outdoors now? Yes. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, by the way, I think there's only one or two states that allow that because of those types of issues. Um, also, that would put us in a situation where um, you've got 10 acres of, of uh, medication, medical marijuana out in the field where a teenager could drive by in the middle of the night, snatch him a bud, and go have a good evening. I, I, I just wanted to make that clear. Um, secondly, um, Chairman McCourtney um, brought up the license. I just want to clarify this as well. So if I understand correctly, I get a two-year license. I get a prescription from a doctor. So I'm going to give you a scenario here and just tell me if I'm well, correct let me, or incorrect. Let Go me ahead. clarify because I think that the terms that we use in this context matter. I believe so, too. You, it's, you don't get a prescription. You get a, a recommendation okay. from a doctor okay. that, 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 you then, that you then forward to the department, and the, that triggers the issuance of the license. Okay. Perfect. So I go to my doctor. I just got rear-ended, headed up here to the Capitol. I got some whiplash. I got some sore muscles. I go to my doctor, some anxiety. My doctor is now saying, hey, you know, I'm going to give you a recommendation for medical marijuana for the next 30 days to kind of help you get over the hump here. Um, I go get a license, and now I can purchase medical marijuana for two years for a 30-day potential issue that was recommended by my doctor. I just, I just want to clarify that um, there is no requirement to even return to the doctor for a, a follow-up or a checkup, um, and I can, and I have a two-year right to go to a dispensary and purchase all of the medical marijuana I want that's within the legal possession amounts. You are correct. Thank you, <laughs> Senator Paxton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to what we was talking about a little bit when I was discussing the issue with schools and, and what they can and can't do. I'll say that my, the last two weeks here, I was uh, extremely impressed with the, the presenters. I think there is, there is uh, the questions I asked, I think they were very sincere answers. Um, I think there's lots of intent to, for us all to solve the same problems that's out there. Um, so I'll just say that, you know, the, the last two weeks, I, I left feeling very, uh, very good about the possibility that we can move forward and get some of these problems solved. But Nonetheless, the intent sounds like that schools could be in an area of limbo as well as employers. So um, here's my question. Looking at on slide 19, talking about the important dates and the time frames. What, is, and I, if I'm understanding it right, September 10th is when the first approval or denial of the licenses come in. Is that when people could start growing their own or is that when a dispensary or a grower could start actually put the seed in the soils at that date when, when they get that? Correct. That is correct. Okay. From that point, and 
I have no idea. How long does it take? In other words, I guess the easy question is, what is the earliest possible date that there would be anything out there legally under this program to smoke or to eat that would contain, contain that product in it? Well, we've, you know, it depends. We've actually done some research in what, you know, what a growth cycle is of, of marijuana. And, and what, we have, what we have learned from our, I think our, uh, again, leaning on the expertise of folks, people at the Department of Agriculture and OBN, you know, all of the um, techniques of, of modern agriculture that have been applied to corn and alfalfa and wheat to expand yield and, and quicken processes can and has been applied to marijuana. So I think we've heard anywhere from 60 to 90 days that is what, it, is what a growth cycle would be that would allow people to have some product that they can, they can use. So potentially sometime November, December time frame, there could actually be, be products out there that would fall under this program. Correct. Okay, thank you. Representative Lori. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do want to thank you for all the work that you and your staff have done. The uh, uh, spokesman for the advocacy groups that have been in here the last two weeks have had very good things to say about their working with you and, and all of that. So I, I think we're all uh, struggling to work within the context of what the voters approved with 788 to try to bring that, implement it, bring it into fruition. But from what I'm uh, hearing from you and, and also what even the spokesman for the advocacy group said, there are some areas where the legislature is going to have to do some things. For instance, and, and you mentioned it earlier, uh, smoking in public places, that, that's going to require some legislative uh, interaction. Within the time frames of what you envision uh, the implement, implementation of this entire process, uh, do you have an opinion as to whether we can wait until the regular session in February or is there a need for earlier legislative action? I think to address the issues that we've, that we've discussed as far as concern about, that, that we have about around public health, um, those issues about testing and others, other areas, then I think the only way to ensure there isn't a gap of time where some where these practices could could get away from us is is to have some type of special session yes but i'm not you know again i, I i've never felt like it was my role as the commissioner of health to come over here and jump up and down and stomp my feet and demand a special session that's that's the that's the your role and that's the decision for you to make. As I have said, we stand ready to implement it as, as it's written. But all of us need to know that if we implement it as written, there are certain gaps in it that we can't fix by rule, and um, we're, we're, we're gonna have to live uh, with, some, with, some, with those gaps. And what that translates to for public health uh, concerns me. Senator Yak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of questions. Um, slide 16, and this is, uh, you said what the, the rule or the, the, from the first set of rules, what got the most public comments was uh, where you removed, where there were limitations placed on the THC content. I guess the implication is those comments you got, the biggest part of them were to remove that restriction. I, I guess. Part of that question was, were any comments in support of limitations in that? Did we, did we get any in support of the THC limit? Uh, we did from uh, representatives of our interagency working group. So since you changed, since you withdrew that, have there been any follow-up public comments regarding removing that limitation? So we haven't been in an active uh, public comment 
period that's been open and uh, available publicly. Um, so I, it, it has not been through that through that formal public comment okay, process. Okay, thank you. Regarding other states, do they have limitations on the THC content in place? So yeah, Yes, they do. Um, I think the thing that uh, that we've learned and one of the subjects, uh, one of the primary subjects of the public comment that we received is that there is distinction between a medical marijuana program and a recreational program. So um, other states do have limits. Uh, the main public comment that we received is that the, the, the limits that were included in the original rule um, seemed more applicable um, from the public comments that we received, um, seemed more applicable for a recreational limit. Um, medicinal limits are uh, sometimes, you know, higher uh, because of the concentration or the dosages that are needed um, for the treatment of the individual. So just to be clear, in other states that have medical marijuana, do any states not have limitations on the THC content? Are you aware? N yeah, not, not that we are aware of or that we've spoken with. So the states you've spoken with, there are no medical marijuana states that, that don't have any limitations? That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, we're not taking public comment right now. Senator Yeck. Off that topic, so regarding, I think this is slide number 19. Um, on the uh, letters that get sent out after applications, so the re acceptance or denial letters, I guess the rest of this process is done electronically, is that right? The application part is done electronically? Yes, that's correct. This calls for those acceptance or letter or denial letters to be mailed. Is there a reason that's? Am I to assume that's emailed or is that done regular mail? That's per the state question. We are required to mail an approval or rejection letter within 14 days. Follow up. So on a denial letter, so is there uh, are reasons given for what those denials might be, and is there, if so, is there a? a just, do they just reapply, or is there a, what's the process at that point? There will be reasons stated. I don't believe we have a process for receiving feedback on the denial. I will look to Alicia to Buffy to clarify, but. But I think in reality, our, if, if, if there is a board certified physician that recommends medical marijuana and they, uh, all the documentation is, the, the form is filled out correctly, and all those documents are attached correctly and uploaded into the system, that there is really no reasonable basis that we would be able to deny an application as the state question is currently written. Okay, thank you. Paula, uh, this, this is a little bit of a philosophical question, so you can take the fifth on it if you want to. This is still illegal, this product's still illegal, federally, like a lot of agencies, and then this topic I'm sure has consumed you and your agency for the last several months, but there is still business as usual. There's a lot of people depend on the services that the health department provides. So going forward, is, is it a concern of yours because many of your programs receive federal dollars, just like a lot of other state programs do, is it a concern of yours that there could be some movement in Washington that, hey, Oklahoma, this is illegal, and you're getting federal funds, do you do you ever see the possibility that some of those federal funds are threatened because of what we're going through at this point in time in Oklahoma? We've had that discussion at the health department. Um, you know, it is something, it, and, I'll, and then, you know, everybody knows I'm, a law, again, a lawyer by trade. The, 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 the fact that this is um, still illegal at the federal level, I mean, should, I think, give us all a little reason for some pause as we proceed. Again, um, that's something that, again, policymakers, legislators will have to, have to wrestle with and, and deal with. But I think, you know, it is, it is an unknown. It's definitely an unknown how, how the federal government will, will treat this going forward and how they will view states that have medical marijuana regimes like Oklahoma. As far as that goes, as far as departments and legislators and this topic, we're all in this together. This was voted on and approved by the people, so I don't know that that, I mean, that's a little bit of a moot question. I get that, but um, it is out there, and it's something that we could, we may have to deal with at some point, so I appreciate you taking the question and responding to that. Representative Rosecrans. 
Uh, thank you very much again. This darn thing. There we go. It's better. Uh, uh, going back to the THC, uh, I just have major questions on that. It's been brought up to me many, many times. So my question is, is there any health studies that say that uh, a higher THC level is, is uh, bad or good? Are there any studies out there? I've, I've tried to research around and I didn't see anything bad necessarily. Do you guys, can you clarify? So um, unfortunately, we've been head down in trying to get the licensure system up. And so really, I, I don't think any of us are prepared to be able to speak to the research base or the evidence uh, you know, on those. Uh, the feedback that we did receive both from interagency group as well as from the public uh, comment, both for and against, um, you know, that, that's where we were primarily receiving um, information on other states and what the recommendations were for THC uh, limits. Follow up. And it, it, that is my next question. Um, you say you work well with Arizona, work close with Arizona. Uh, are there any other, he already, uh, Senator Yak already asked if there was any other states that have done this, and you said no, I believe is what you said, uh, with a limitation. Um, are there other states that are talking about it, or they're thinking about it, and have you spoken to them as to why, perhaps? So I, um, I don't believe our conversations with other states have been specifically on the THC uh, topic. Um, it's been more about the operational standing up of a licensure system is where our conversations have been um, primarily directed. Very good. And I've got kind of a different question, if you don't mind. And then this will be my last one. I know I ask a lot of questions. It's, it's I'm a former teacher. It's what I do. I do a lot of research. Um, one of my number one questions really is, this is medical marijuana, and it seems to me like it's being treated a little bit like it's, it's already recreational. So are you saying that state question 788 is closer to recreational than to medical? Because I'm getting kind of you know, both ways. Kind of an opinion question, really, if, if you don't mind. State question 788 doesn't require any qualifying conditions. It's a two-year license. And to Senator McCourtney's and others' earlier questions, it requires no follow-up visits. And after that, they can obtain the product um, as outlined by the, uh, uh, at the limitation levels as outlined by the state question without limit um, for two years. So, I mean, I think I'll just, you know, you can draw your own conclusions with that. Sure. I, I very much appreciate your answer. Thank you very much. A um, couple more questions from the chair, and then I feel like we're winding down. Um, I, on, on that subject of, of the two-year license, I just want to clarify one more time. Is there, a, is there a way that a physician can revoke their recommendation? Uh, if for, what, for whatever reason, if that physician changes their mind or if they want to shorten the term by revoking, is that possible in the system that we have set up at this point? Not in the most recent version of the rules. Um, I believe a, a prior version did um, provide for a physician withdrawal form and a process, uh, but that was removed with the most recent um, version. Thank, thank you. And then one more on somehow I had missed before this meeting that one of the things rolled back is the prohibition on public smoking. Um, and this may not be the question for you guys. I, I'm not sure exactly what does that mean? I mean, can property owners continue to ban public smoking or, I mean, I, I guess, what, what does it mean that public smoking of marijuana is allowed at this point? Right now, under the Clean Indoor, I'm sorry, Adrian Rollins, um, under the Clean Indoor Air statutes, there are loopholes, um, and that is really what we're referring to. So there is allowable smoking in restaurants if they have a separate enclosed air. We're really talking about um, bars, um, also have some allowabilities as well as hotels, 
um, have a certain percentage. So this is where there might be some some cross um, with the public and secondhand smoke, which in marijuana we do have the research that shows that secondhand smoke from marijuana is equally um, as as risky in, in the public health interest. All right, thank you. So just to clarify, basically the way it stands now, anywhere that you can smoke cigarettes, you would be able to smoke marijuana. Anywhere that you're not able to smoke cigarettes, you're also not able to smoke marijuana. Is that correct with the rules as they stand today? <laughs> yes, that is correct. And, and I'll also add that the other loophole that I didn't mention is at-home daycares after hours of operation. Okay. Thank you. I just act like I don't see. Uh, yes. <laughs> Re Representative Fettgetter for just one. Just one, and it's, and it's real simple. I know we have been really dealing with a lot of critical issues here, but I'm just curious. Do we have a process, process set up and in place for the 25-75% ownership rule at this point? How are we going to make a verification? What's the verification process look like? So we are requesting a list of all owners as well as documentation of ownership. <laughs> And we will be reviewing all of that to ensure that 75% of those owners are Oklahoma residents. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see no other questions from the committee. I thank you very much for being here. I thank you for uh, honest, frank, and, and short answers when uh, grandstanding and trying to avoid the questions uh, may have been a more popular stance. So I, I appreciate you being here. Uh, and again, very much appreciate the work that you've put in. I cannot begin to imagine the hours that some of you have put in uh, over the last few months preparing for this. So uh, thank you very much. And with that, uh, I will adjourn this meeting. <laughs>